Uh, for the record sure. questions, in which war did you serve? Yeah, World War II. And what was your branch of service? It was uh, infantry most of the time, but I was assigned to like the British uh, Marines. I did a long time with them uh, at, at invasion time. And uh, then I'd go back to infantry. And then I, I served with the uh, famous combat team in Italy, uh, where Bob Dole and uh, uh, Dan Inouye, the, the senator from uh, Hawaii. They were just alongside of us in Italy. Yeah. That's crazy. Up in the Alps. Yeah, that was a good adjective. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What was the highest rank you reached in service? Sergeant. Sergeant. And then finally, the general locations. What general locations did you serve? Well, the first would be in Italy. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I spoke. Uh, wrong. Uh, it was in England, the Battle of Britain. Yeah, and yeah, we got there in 1941, and we were left for the African invasion uh, about nine months later, so I'd have to use the calendar to find out. And then uh, we stayed in Africa with the anti-aircraft, uh, and we saw a little combat there. Uh, and then we invaded Italy at uh, the big invasion. It was a really uh, a lot of casualties. It was tough, uh, but we prevailed. And, uh, we had everybody helping us, though. <laughs> the uh, the uh, paratroopers. And another division, I believe it was the 34th Division, because we thought we were going to have to evacuate. Yeah, the first five days were bad. So that uh, it was an if thing. But I don't know how we did it, but we, we did push them back. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that you did. Yeah, it, it was a... So going back a little bit down memory lane yeah. here, uh, from the from the very beginning of yeah. your military service, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. I tried to enlist in the Navy, but they wouldn't have me. Really? They told me to come back when I could shave. <laughs> <laughs> so where were you living at that time? In Jersey City, in, in New Jersey. Do you recall the date? Pardon? Do you recall the date? I was living there? Yeah. Oh, I, I was living there right up to the time I was uh, drafted. That would be 1941. Uh, I would say I was living there about 10 years, oh, 10, wow. maybe a little better. How old were you at the time? Well, I was a teenager. Yeah. 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 Were you 17 or 18? Yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, 17 or 18? Yeah. So why, why did you want to join? I, I wanted to join the uh, uh, Air Force because I could fly a plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought I could fly, but they didn't. <laughs> no, but I was accepted into the Air Corps. What I was instructing in the, air, the aircraft, a new gun. It was from Sweden. And it interests me quite a bit, and I was determined to know all I could, so I became an instructor, and uh, I passed all the tests, the gunners' tests and stuff, so that uh, the guns were an inspiration to me. As a teenager, you know, you, you never come across any. any uh, Artillery and stuff like that, yeah. but we we uh, we 
had a good outfit after it was trained. They were very good in uh, successful missions. Here. We never knew whether we hit them or not, uh, because uh, they were flying too fast. But early on, the Germans had slow paid uh, uh, airplanes, the Fokker. And the folk did a good job on Holland. They did, oh, they did terrible. But it was only going to 50, 150 miles per hour. It was nothing. <laughs> we loved them. <laughs> easy to shoot down for easy yeah, air? Oh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, excuse me, I get congested. No problem. <coughs> I'm all right. Okay. If you ever need to take a break, just let me know. No, I just, uh, I'll ask Mary Lou for one of her bottles of water. And, 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 uh, so, let, let's talk about, you're now in the Air Corps. What, how's, how was your boot camp experience? And how was the boot camp experience in basic training? In basic training, I didn't do the Air Corps. The day they called me up, we were leaving uh, for Europe with the air take craft, and I had about five minutes to decide, decide whether to go with the air corps or stay with the. Well, I got so attached to the people and I was training, and they were such good people, you know. So I figured I'll stay with them. But that's when I wound up with the British Marines. Because the first assignment was uh, under Queen Mary. And then after that, uh, a French luxury line of call, what did they call that? I can't call, recall the name. They invaded Africa. And then in uh, Invading Italy was an American homemade plane. Uh, yeah, it wasn't that good. <laughs> now, it was a new concept. They had it so that the base of the, uh, the ship was a runway so banks could, uh, banks, uh, so were tanks and at that time they had ducks. Uh, they could just roll right out. And then there was a ramp at the end to go uh, hit the beach. There, it didn't do it. <laughs> oh my. Not that when we wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so then they were the three ships that were, you know, had merit. I was on others, but they were just like transport, you know. Uh, so, when, so you, you had a pretty short training experience then before the Air Corps went over to Europe and, and joined the, the British? Oh, oh no, I see, I see. I had good training in the anti aircraft to be an instructor. So that, you know, it was a question of taking the best they had to offer. And, uh, there was no guarantee I was going to fly. You know, you have to go through their training, and uh, uh, it was a tough decision to make because I had nothing but respect for anyone in the Air Corps. Uh, in fact, most of the people I worked with, they were all in the Air Corps, and they were trying to persuade me to come with them. And uh, I'm glad I didn't because they, we lost a lot of them, yeah. And, uh, but they, uh, they were going to be experts on the uh, B-24. That was the one made by Ford Motor Car Company uh, to supersede the B-17. Uh, it never would, never will. <laughs> the B-17 was something. So I was assigned to the B-17 on one trip, uh, but it wasn't combat, uh, yeah. So was there, was there like, 
and just still on the focus of training uh, for a second. Yeah. Um, was there one instructor when you were learning yeah. everything before you became an instructor yourself who you really looked up to or really helped you throughout your time uh, in your early service? Uh, actually, being a new uh, unit to the United States uh, Infantry, uh, I guess we all had to learn together. So you were you were essentially the first of of any of the instructors, well, or with the know, first group of instructors at least. Uh, I, I, there was nothing uh, unusual, but you know, just by trip, I picked up a magazine on a train back from New Jersey up to the camp, and in I read it, it's something about a Swedish gun. And I read that thing over and over again. So when it came to the uh, examination on the machine gun, which I was good on the machine gun, so I passed that easy. So the, the question was put to me, tell me everything you know about the BOFA, they called it a BOFA at the time. and. Uh, I told him everything <laughs> about the <coughs> Swedish steel and, and the the, uh, uh, the barrel of the gun and so forth, all the outstanding features of it. So that, that passed the gun as to uh, uh, But uh, I don't know why I passed. I was assigned to the uh, gun range, and we take turns, you know, as a safety officer, and then we'd have to go to the pits, and that's where they mark. Uh, they have to be uh, on a log pole. They have a disc. They show you where you hit, and. Uh, I remember this this one time I was marking one pretty high and I laid it up I lost the thing and it hit an officer right on the head. <laughs> Lo and behold, that's the guy that questioned me. <laughs> but he, he didn't hold it against me. <laughs> no, that's just one of the things, you know, you're learning. A basic training, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little luck too. <laughs> so, when when basic training ended, where did you go? Yeah, to basic training, we went uh, directly on the Queen Mary. So you're on the Queen Mary. So, when when you're on the Queen Mary and when you're in England, what were your first impressions when you arrived there? It was a beautiful ship, but they had it wartime equipped, you know, and uh, it was uh, something I, I didn't think a man could make as beautiful as the Queen Mary was. Uh, yeah. So what, what was your first assignment when you got there? Uh, well, <laughs> not with a gun, with the... Uh, Rockets, yeah, they, that's what the Marines used for anti-aircraft. They had a basket, of, uh, two baskets on either side, and they had rockets about 12 on each side. And when they saw an airplane, they'd throw it up and hope that the airplane drives through the rockets because it was a good spray. And I was with the... That was my first assignment on the uh, uh, But I didn't do any instructing. Uh, I stayed with the Marines. And uh, when we landed in Scotland, uh, we got a train down, down to around Liverpool. And uh, we did a lot of Again, basic training, 
But I had a chance to go with the Marines, and I went with the Marines, and I went to all their schools. So I sharpened up all my identification of aircraft and all that, so that uh, I didn't waste any time in England. But we were there with the raids, and they were terrible. Oh, my goodness, they could. The Germans would come up and, like a typewriter, go up one end street and go down the next. Uh, of course, the only thing the English had was the Spitfire, and uh, they didn't have enough of them. They had enough of them, they didn't have enough pilots. And uh, like Churchill said, they complained to Churchill He's not using the airplanes that they made for him. He says, look, it takes 28 days for a chicken to hatch an egg. <laughs> it takes time <laughs> to train a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. But they were actually good pilots. And they were not officers. They were sergeants. And uh, they had a, a movie camera right on the gun so that they always had proof. You know, they could, oh, we saw so many films, uh, the, the hits that they made. Yeah, that was something. Uh, but they only pick out the ones that look good. They don't show any others. <laughs> uh, but we left for Africa after about nine months in England. And then Africa was uh, not exactly a war atmosphere. I, uh, was how how did daily life in England and your service there differ from daily life in Africa? And then and, and what's the other place? Africa. Africa. So oh, the two world different of areas. Are well yeah. Yeah. The English spoke our language, you know, and. Uh, there was a lot of entertainment and shows, and uh, they were very good. Uh, we got along good with them. Uh, uh, in fact, they were good to us. Uh, but at that time, Ireland was not on this, our side, and uh, they were actually not involved in the war at all. Really. Yeah. So I forget we had a stop in Ireland for, for I don't know whether it was for fuel or something. And uh, we went ashore a little bit with the uh, British Marines. Because I had an American uniform on, you know, and but they had theirs, you know. So they, uh, they had to the dock workers or something else. And they insulted the English to no end. And this is what I said to them, what are you bothering, bothering me for? My name is O'Neill. <laughs> they said to me, we got O'Neills to burn. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, it's a... But there was... Uh, uh, still the feeling, you know, that the Irish were bitter against the English. And uh, it lasted the war, too. Yeah, they didn't... Uh, it's not too different today as well. Yeah, yeah. Still a little tension between yeah, the two. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> the book writes it a little differently, but... Uh, so you're now... So after nine months in England, uh, and... Oh, des describe like what it was like in the raids. In the one when there were air raids. In the air raids. Yes. Well, they were bombing the docks in Liverpool, and uh, one of our guns, you could put it on automatic. It would fire 122 a minute. Uh, a British major came up. And he says, man, you know, each round costs a, what do you say, a, 
a barber would be equivalent to five, uh, uh, a slang name for five dollars. And he actually admonished this for wasting enemies. The docks are burning all the time. <laughs> They would still worry about the cost of ammunition. Uh, but uh, we didn't take it any part in that. We were uh, not bystanders. We were ready to, to do what we had to do. Yeah. But uh, it didn't last very long. They did a lot of damage though, boy. Yeah. They had a lot of, they, they fly over in waves. And they did the same in Africa. But what we learned in England, we used in Africa. We we would expect them to come, and they would come in waves, and they come at night. And uh, I remember they came as a, we were on a a port of Oran. They had a lot of freighters. They come in a little inlet there. Well, they knew all about the inlet, and this. they come down, and we were expecting. We had information that there would be a raid, but we were afraid to fire because there was a lot of friendly fire. We were shooting down our own. Yeah. So I told my group. Don't fire till I tell you to. Yeah. They didn't. They just <laughs> they really fired the first shot, but they knew it was a German raid. You know that's uh, yeah, but that was our uh, I guess that was our merit. Uh, we never shot down one that uh, we didn't identify first, you know. And, uh, and then we had a lot of battalions. They would, what they call them, they, they had another name for them. They would swim underground, underwater with a bomb. The bomb just put it against the plate of a ship, you know, what a mess, yeah. So that all night long they would, we would drop what they call ash cans from one of the uh, small ships. So all night long the bomb was going, like a bomb going off. But there was no more where uh, Italian swimmers left. <laughs> they were <laughs> so how did the, what did it feel like to be in these kinds of situations on an almost daily basis? Yeah, you know, the first time you're scared. I don't say everybody was scared, but you got a feeling, you know. But the second time, no, you were a warrior. Yeah, you, you know what you're doing, and you're just angry to get them, you know. <laughs> but. Uh, didn't always work out, but they they had uh, uh, we had good good records. Air Force did good in, in Africa too. Uh, how long how long did you spend in Africa when you were in North Africa? Uh, about a year, I guess it was about a year. Yeah, it's not a happy country, you know. Uh, the uh, the ship that we went it was a French tourist ship, and our American officers, the superior officers, he said it was a floating sewer pipe. It's not as neat as the American Navy. Oh no, no. Uh, and uh, there was a big change 
you know, from normal to the abnormal. You know, the, the streets, they had no sewage. You know, and, uh, uh, it was disgusting. Uh, yet, they were play we went to a, a concert right there in Iran. It was the 25th anniversary of a famous piano player playing Dubussy. And uh, there the discipline was greater than you find in this country. Don't cough, don't, don't rattle, oh no, no. no. Yeah. So there was a mixture, a little bit, the Free French, they didn't like us. No, they actually wouldn't even talk to us. The officers, we'd salute them and they wouldn't salute back because uh, when we first got in there, they were really firing on us. Yeah. Wait, and, so the French were, were firing on you? Yeah. Really? And we gave the French uh, a whole squadron of 36 uh, B-36, P-36. And uh, for some reason, our Air Force didn't like it. So that uh, as when they became a, an ally, uh, they give them the whole squadron. Yet, as soon as they went up in the air, we had orders to go into what they call a yellow alert. That means everybody on the gun, you know, and the gun is loaded, just in case they drop anything. Because we we didn't think they were that friendly. So there wasn't there wasn't a lot of trust between the U.S. and the British and the French. No, um, no, 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 no. But the U.S. and the British did get along very well. I'd say yes, they did. Yeah, it was a lot of they were always regular guys, you know. But they were all career people. They've been in like twenty or thirty years, and uh, yeah. Uh, so what? Where? What cities were you in in North Africa? Where were you stationed? We were stationed. Yeah. We were stationed at the uh, Foreign Legion headquarters. And where was that? That was in Oran. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were, you were in North Africa, and, and like you said, life sort of. Compared to, to being in, in Britain for the nine months before oh, that, yeah. oh, definitely yeah. a lot oh, different. Yeah, Can yeah, you like, yeah. describe comparing exactly. the two together, how they were? I didn't want to bring that up, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was nothing. Uh, the water, oh, you couldn't drink. Malaria was, oh, I got malaria over there. And... Uh, there was no defense, uh, and then another thing, uh, we got orders, anybody gets sunburned, gets court-martialed, yeah, because it's, the sun is really a weapon, uh, nature's weapon, uh, and we, we, when we were landed, we had the world winter uniform on, and we had to wear it all through Africa, while the English had their shorts and the khakis. <laughs> but we survived. It was, uh, we saw a lot of ships and submarines. They kept submarines in Oran, and that was a sight. They they housed the thing. I don't know what, what you call it. It would come out just about dawn, a black, ugly thing, all black, you know. Come out. And I don't know when it came back, but they'd always came back. They never got it. <laughs> uh, and did you see combat other than what you described with the French, uh, but with the Germans or the Italians in North Africa? Well, yeah, was, yeah, on the invasion, yes. We were about, 
Well, we're there about five days, and it's questionable whether we evacuate, go back, you know. Was this was this in Italy or was this in North Africa? This was at, at the uh, Italian invasion at Serla. No. So, yeah. uh, can you talk about from when you left North Africa to when you were heading to Italy? Yeah, oh yeah. Everything that was going through your mind. Oh that. yeah, that that was real combat. They really had they outnumbered us. They were waiting for us, and uh, yeah, we lost a lot of men. And, uh, uh, but the 36th Division made the, the Texas, and they were very angry at their commanding officer. They wanted him caught martial. I mean, we were with the 36th Division. I, I I couldn't find anything, you know, uh, bad enough to a court martial anybody here. And in what division were you in quickly? Sorry, Dan. What? what division were you with? Uh, at the All time? of them. All of them. No, we were actually the combat team. Where you were needed, they would put you in, into the. We we were with the uh, first black regiment. Yeah, in Italy. Yeah. That when they first went into combat, yeah, yeah. And we were with the 36. I can't think of all the numbers, sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but the, <clears throat> we more or less volunteered to be in the combat area. Uh, that is, as a combat uh, unit. Uh, in fact, I looked it up in my papers there. You're supposed to volunteer. I couldn't remember volunteering. Yeah, but my name is there. <laughs> so, like sort of going back to North Africa, and, you know, you said you spent about a year there. Yeah. When did you find out that you would be, well, you volunteered, but you would be voluntold to go to Italy and, and join there? What? The few weeks before, can, can you just describe that whole like situation when you were still in North Africa, but yeah. you, you knew you were going over to Italy? What went through your mind and, and what it was like? Well, we had station? to prepare for it. We knew about it. Of course, they had just invaded Sicily, and that was nothing you know, worthy of being a worry about there. And we were well prepared, well trained. So that we didn't expect the combat that we did get, the resistance, the Germans, the, uh, they, uh, they probably had better intelligence than we had given them. Uh, we heard, there's a lot of stories you hear about uh, who made the mistake and who did the uh, reconnaissance, you know. Uh, but that you, nobody knows the truth because uh, they have a war room and you don't go near it. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you an instance about the war room. We always kept two sentries outside the door. Nobody goes in unless they, they pass and so forth. But at exactly six o'clock in the evening, uh, an officer comes out and he gives you the, cash, the uh, password for the night. I happen to be on this duty outside, and the password uh, that night was, uh, well, I'll say Happy Hill. and. Uh, at nine o'clock, they had a, a German broadcast, uh, Sally, a woman, uh, and uh, she would play records and then give you nasty, you know. Uh, and she'd say, at nine o'clock that night, uh, don't forget the password, and she knew it. Yeah. In three hours. But they said, well, Jesus, who, 
who was weak enough to give it. No. We, we'd get the password from the Germans the same way. You capture a prisoner and he's got to give you it. And uh, so that didn't bother me that much. Uh, but it, 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 the technique that they use to spread it, and the, mostly the, uh, the people that were after were the British soldiers, and uh, they keep telling them about all the Americans are having a good time back on your... <laughs> well, that's, that's, that was just part of the war. But the Italian campaign was not easy. Yeah, we... Can you, can you go more in depth? Uh, Pardon? Just, can you go more in depth about it, uh, if you're comfortable? The what? Can you go more in depth about it, if, you, if you're comfortable doing so? Oh, yeah, I know a lot of things that happened. And you don't talk about the US. Uh, it was never printed in the theater. These war correspondents, they just, they just take what was given to them and they write it down and that's, you know, uh, uh, no, but we were glad when the war was over uh, in Italy. Uh, it was o over about a month before it was declared in Europe and uh, Oh, it was all over. We were at that time merely guarding the prisoners. So when the war was over, we had a couple of prisoners we had used to work. We invited them into the tent, and in the tent we had a big bucket of and all the liquor and everything you could think of, <laughs> and. Uh, But after the war was over, you don't go home unless you have so many points. They give you points and sort of thing. And you needed 85 points to go home. I had 83. And uh, <laughs> so I, I went around I found out that the next uh, outfit that's got a, what they call the uh, a green uh, that would be you can fly home instead of going by boat, and that was an artillery outfit. So I transferred to the artillery, and uh, by the same technique, I found out the air corps has an opening. So I went on the B-17 legally because I was qualified. To be, and they don't, they don't move a B-17 unless they have a full, it's fully manned. So I filled in as a machine gunner. No combat though. We flew from Naples, Casablanca, down across the desert to Dakar, that's the equator. And then from there you fly across to Natal, uh, Brazil. That's the shortest distance over water, and uh, you're glad to land. But the B-17, we had, had a lot of mechanical trouble. So we were landing in these little countries, uh, going up to... Uh, our, our first target was uh, West Palm Beach. We must have stopped about eight times for repairs in uh, New well, there's Guiani, British and, and American, and uh, they all had equipment, parts and everything else. It was planned ahead of time, K-shaped force landing, you, you, and that ours was a force. We had four engines, but we were only using two. So uh, we took a long time coming home. So, uh, and they were, the, the, the mission was to fly 
to Nebraska, and they have a, what they call a graveyard out there. They park all the uh, old planes out in a cornfield or something. Well, I didn't go to Nebraska, because I had uh, malaria, and that's a good reason for <coughs> going on sick call. So I went on sick call, but they didn't. My crew had left. So I took the train back to Fort Dix and go through the process and it's all over. So that was that was about the end of the, yeah. your time in the military? They give you three hundred dollars and you go home. Really? Yeah. How much, if you could give an equivalent to today, how much would three hundred dollars be? Three hundred dollars would be about nine hundred. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they, they pay very well now. We start at $21 a month. Now today, I understand it's, you can live on it, whatever they get. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of money to get for. Uh, so, for your, now that's like the, the overview. It's, it's amazing, I think, that you were in three different sort of arenas of war, starting in England and then North Africa and Italy. Well, I, I, I was fortunate. I saw a lot of the country. Yeah. And I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, only up in the Alps when, at the same time, Bob Dole and Dan Inouye, I got hit too. And, uh, uh, so for going going back to Italy for a second, when you landed in Italy, was that actually like an invasion wave or did we already have Oh no, it here? was an invasion equal to the one that was made on D Day and yes. Could you go a little more? Oh definitely? absolutely. Yeah, in fact at no time did the uh, the big invasion in France did they consider going back? But in the one we took at Salerno, we had five days to decide whether to go back and give up. But uh, that wasn't my decision to make because it was the high brass. Can, can you describe the exact. But luckily, we had backup paratroopers came in. And uh, I believe it was the was the former National Guards from Oklahoma. Yeah, it was Oklahoma. Yeah. And uh, of course, when you get a whole division in, that's a lot of people. And uh, and the Germans just slowly moved up. They had the Germans had a good commander, uh, Kesselring, his name was General Kesselring, and his mission was just to lay the Americans, so they don't get a chance to go through the Bremer Pass, which from Italy you go right into Austria and into Germany. So that there was a lot of delay in tactics. They burn up bridges and viaducts and railroads and everything else. Uh, we had a good engineering group. I, I never hear them mention engineers in the, the war books and what have you, but unbelievable, they worked very good. Uh, now, with, with the division you were assigned with? Um, well, every, every division had their own engineering section. Yeah. They they would put up a bridge over a river overnight. Oh wow. And they did it at night. Yeah. But for for when when you're with the the, the waves of the, the landing forces, did you and, and particularly with the division you were with, uh, suffer many casualties? Uh, well you better reword that <laughs> um The, the fighting was intense. 
Uh, oh, yes, right, yeah. Right, yeah. And how, how was the, the casualty count? Oh, sometimes 30%. Yeah. Our group was what, about 50%. Yeah, half the guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you did you have anyone you were particularly friendly with on, on a personal level that uh, ended up getting hurt? No, we were we were well trained, but some of the uh, missions were beyond human. You know, it's like going up a, a cliff where they got a machine gun on top. You know, and, uh, uh, so what? What you know through those circumstances? Because I'm sure, like you said, the five days you weren't sure, and that must be uh, very, very hard to deal with in those times. What yeah. What kept you pushing forward? Um, what kept you motivated throughout that time? Well, out there, uh, my buddy, closest guy. Uh, he went out, one of our guys stepped out of minefield and he went out to help him. Also a medic went out and they shot the medic and they shot my friend. That's war within a small unit. So it only took us about an hour to eliminate the, the Germans and this. Uh, yeah, that, that was one of the big motivations, uh, you know, when you have a, a close person, to, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, there's a risk in everything. You know, I, see. I, I mean, actually, uh, your chances of getting hit is about the same as getting hit with a truck. You know, you, 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 have, you have no control of it. Your plight, you know, when it's rolling over you, it's that's it. Uh, well, the attack would come in. And, there was no defense. So. But eventually, you did manage to push them back, and luckily the war in Italy yeah. ended, and then solely after the war yeah. in Europe did. So, on that, and that, that's an amazing story, yeah. I think, personally. Yeah. Uh, and, and coming from you know someone my age who can yeah. only really hear about the conflict from reading yeah. in history books, I, I really uh, thank you for helping me with this. But. Now we sort of move on to the, the everyday life aspect uh, of the things and yeah. then uh, what happened after the fact. So with, with family back home, how did you stay in touch with them throughout the entire well, I had four brothers. The last one didn't have to go because there's a ruling now. Right? You only have to have three in the family. And the Excuse because there was, I think, four brothers on a ship. The ship went down, you know, and uh, they changed the, the ruling that not too many in one family on, you know, in the same area. Yeah. But uh, back home, we just wrote letters. Letters, they photographed them down to it, uh, about an inch by an inch <laughs> uh, to, to save uh, space in the mail room. You know, and, uh, packages were hard to get through. And, uh, did, you, did you ever get a package that you were like, Yes, <laughs> I've been waiting for this for the longest time. Well, no, because all these heavy drinkers <laughs> were drinking after shave. Yeah, 
but they wasn't after shave. They were dumped out at home and filled with whiskey. So I would write home and say, I need shaving cream. I figured they know about it. You know. I never got any. <laughs> Cigarettes are hard to come by. You got four a day from the army. Well, you ration the four a day. But we lived on the rations. The rations were, let me see, scientifically prepared. That's about it. <laughs> what, what, what was the rations and the food in particular like? Well, it depends upon what area. Usually in the, if you're in the light combat area, you got cans, three, three cans, a choice of three uh, uh, beans in one can. And then there was an egg salad or something. That was uh, nobody ate that. And uh, I'm trying to think what that three. You only had a choice of three, and nobody would eat it. But I had a dog with me, and he loved it. <laughs> so, so speaking of your dog, because you know dogs are man's best friend. Yeah. Uh, I think everyone agrees with it. When did you or and dogs actually help with stress? Yeah. When were you ever under personally where you felt like you were under just way too much pressure or too much stress? Yeah. And if so, how did you handle it? Well, it's hard to equate, you know, pressure and, uh, you know. We coped. And. Uh, when there was any pressure, we were more or less the equivalent of holding hands, but not holding, not doing it, but we were that close to each other, and we wanted each other to be all right, and that helps a lot. And then uh, we had a training uh, thing that when one guy got shot, we had somebody to replace him right away. And uh, we trained on that a lot. We just used numbers. We had 15 numbers, and each number represented something to do. And somebody on the computer or the range finder, different things. You needed a man. But if anything happened to him, we immediately had somebody trained to step in so we could keep in. in in tune with the mission, if we were firing, you know, and uh, we didn't lose too many. We did. We, in fact, while I was there, they didn't lose any. Uh, but they have these bombs come in. They spray, you know. It's a, it's like a. Uh, uh, Fireworks when they, but they the Germans had a bomb they called a screaming meaning, and it would buy, explode about five feet above the surface, and then it would spray all kinds of steel and sharp uh, things. You lose a lot of men there because. It's it's like a, a god knows, you know. Somebody has to get wet. Yeah. So was there was there anything like in that situation that you and your your buddies and fellow servicemen would say for good luck or do for good luck, like a little ritual? Well, everybody was responsible for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But you have like a, you know, some, in, in the theater, you say break a leg before you go on stage kind of thing. Did you have a, a ritual that everyone would do before a mission? No, we didn't have any ritual at all. Uh, other than, would you say, are you okay, Lynch? Yeah. You and know. on top of that, how, how did you feel about 
most of your fellow servicemen. I know you said you really loved uh, the people in the Air Corps. Uh, and you were talking about sort of like this, this family bond that goes on. You well, know, the, care about each other. He was a, a person on your mission. Uh, there's, there's a great bondage, a very strong dependency on everybody. So that uh, that helps a lot. Uh, and you more or less would protect, like if you were going on a, a mission, a patrol, well, you wouldn't take anybody that had a cold, because if they cough, you give away your position, see. So little deals like that you have to clear up before you go into a, an area where there's a risk. and. Uh, but even in, in a risky area, we had a, a, pas, a patrol uh, that carried their own army. Yeah, they, was, they, they used a gun that they used in World War I. The Browning automatic rifle. And uh, we took three men to... Uh, one guy to shoot it and two guys to carry it and, <laughs> and get the ammo for it. And uh, uh, but everybody knows the mission, and uh, you knew, know when to uh, take cover. And uh, there was little. Uh, symbols uh, to warn or have a mission, you know, and uh, uh, although we didn't have it in ours, uh, the paratroopers had it. They had one of these little things that you buy them in a knowledge store. they like a cricket, you touch it, you spin it out of steel, and that was the single. Uh, and, uh, but the Germans knew all about that. <laughs> so the Germans were pretty good with intelligence. From it was very guys. little they didn't know. <laughs> uh, but we knew that they knew. Uh, and that's, that's what helps a lot, you know. Uh, uh, but the toughest part of the whole World War Two was at the invasion coming ashore, yeah, that was tough. What was that like? Oh, it was terrible. The guys would get the shooting in the water coming ashore, yeah. A lot of them drowned, yeah. And uh, when uh, we did the uh, invasion of Italy, all the landing spots uh, were all the colors, blue, red, orange, uh, and uh, I think the toughest one was at Paystrom. It was a Greek uh, town at one time, and they, they had and uh, there's our guys took a beating, yeah, yeah. And most of them, when I went back and Ray referred them, most of them came from Worcester Street, New Haven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really? Did they like Sally's Pizza? Yeah, <laughs> yes, I see. Did you keep a, a journal? No, but I have. A whole bag full of the actual war, every inch. Yeah, because I have a book on Solano and a book on the Volturno, you know, and it's it's written by a and uh, the worst one was after. Ezio. And uh, 
we were all told to hold so General Clark could come up and drive into Rome as the yeah, that bothered us. And uh, while we're holding the positions, oh, we must have allowed 25,000 Germans, yeah, to go through the pass. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, there was that mo there were that moments, you know, where yeah. But that's that's war. The general has to come in victorious and General MacArthur, he did the same thing. Yeah. They know what it counts. <laughs> uh, were you ever um Injured yeah. or in with the threat of injury while in combat. Yeah. But to sum up, everybody is in the same position. You know, there's no. You're not singled out as anything better, and uh, you can't uh, be naked. Because it would only hurt you and hurt everybody else, and you, you get to know that, you know, that uh, especially when you're moving, you know, uh, they call it march order. That means all your equipment has to go to a new position, and uh, you're almost helpless while you're changing positions, you know. Yeah. But uh, I don't think, uh, I can't think of only one instance where we had trouble moving. And uh, Rommel, he figured it out. You're good, sir. Just checking the. Uh, yeah, sure. Make sure it's still going. Rommel was, uh, he was the winner in Africa. The Desert Fox. Well, we had, uh, our unit had two trucks, and one truck pulled the unit, the, the artillery unit, and the other was just a, a, a carrier of junk, you know, your, bag, your personal drawings and everything else. So Rommel discovered in loading we just haphazardly loaded. No, we loaded according to Pentagon. They have a book. And we did have to have everything in place there. So well, Romo captured, I don't know how many of us, by he could separate the truck from the thing there. We had rifles in the truck, but no ammunition. It's in the... Carrier, <laughs> everything was you know, uh, we needed. So you, you have to give up because you have no weapons, and they they got you, you surrender. But the story is that Rommel couldn't believe that the American army was so weak that they would give up that many. He actually visited it. A prison uh, place, and he himself said that uh, that they did, had discovered the loading uh, arrangement, and it was a weakness. And uh, so that was one of the jobs we had, and we had to all had to make a better plan. So my outfit submitted the best plan, you know, what they knew everything, <laughs> and uh, but that we didn't have that problem with the uh, the tank separating the our, our best units. Uh, understand? We learned all this in basic training, you know, and. And afterwards in training, you know, if we found a better system, 
system, we would use it, you know. Of, we found out somebody else on our side uses it. Uh, we would copy it if we could. Uh, yeah. That's, that's so the ingenuity story. of the American. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I feel like I need to take a second taping of this eventually. Yeah. I feel like there's so much more we could cover. I actually only have a little bit of time left on yeah. this. But if you'd be open to it, I, I'd like to do a bit of a longer interview, uh, if we can as well. Um, well, possibly another time. I'll leave it up to you. You, you <laughs> hit the high points and we'll try it. So, let's move. It interested me that you, you had malaria on your way back when yeah. your uh, unit was flying to Nebraska. So, can you, can you talk about your after-service experience starting from there? Like, what was the homecoming reception like? After Africa? Uh, and no, when, you, when you're coming back uh, home. Like, you had flown to Brazil, and then you flew uh, oh, to the US, wait, and you still had malaria, so you were sick. Uh, so you took the train home. What was, yeah, what was your homecoming reception like? Well, actually, I, I arrived at uh, my home in Jersey uh, about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, after the train station, we took a shuttle type. So I knew there were a couple of taxi cabs there. And uh, I took the cab taxi cab. And he drove me home and he carried the bag up to the apartment where my mother lived. And uh, I don't know, he didn't charge me. I, or he, if he did charge me, he charged me so little. You know, that was the best homecoming. <laughs> that they're not going to shaft us. <laughs> How was, was your mother really happy to see you yeah. when you stopped by? Oh, yes, yes. What was yes. it like in the, the home? Oh, it was just my mother home, you know. I didn't even call home. You know, I figured she... So it was almost like one of those movie yeah. reunions? Yeah. But then I, after a while I went to see my girlfriend and... Uh, we decided to get married, you know. And then it's a long story. It has nothing to do with the Army. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it, the, the point of that, like, how... It, in sort of wrapping this up, yeah. How how do you think your your experience in the military and everything uh, you went through uh, affected the rest of your life? Oh, I I would say greatly uh, influenced my way of life, my uh, nutritious hab habits. Uh, Yeah, I, I would say that uh, I learned a lot, you know, from preserving myself beyond bullets. <laughs> uh, no, you they're very disciplined in how you dress, and they're meticulous on detail. And you learn all those things, and you carry it through life. And uh, uh, I, I remember uh, we used to take our boots and they had to be under the bed, but they had to be next to one another. You couldn't have one here, one here. <laughs> so I went into civilian, I couldn't get over the I was putting my shoes on. <laughs> there was no need for that. <laughs> No, it, uh, it had to be, and we gave it our best effort, and, uh, and I disagree with uh, that uh, journalist or whatever his name was, he wrote a book, The Best Generation. We were not the best generation. You said, you know the best, best generation? 
it's you. You think? <laughs> really? Them parrot? Yes. Yeah, actually, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Luckily, that, that book has not yet been written. Um, no, well, no, 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 no. So. But uh, actually, uh, there's a whole new way of thinking. You're, you're way ahead. I never knew about politics or anything like that. In fact, I didn't even know the senator's name. Yeah, I know now, but uh, I mean, it's important. Yeah. But I, everything is, I don't think there will be another war like the, uh, the Second World War. And uh, I think the war wasn't necessary, but that's my thought. I mean, others had better thoughts, but uh, well, it gave me a chance to see politics in other countries. And really, I didn't see any, any better than ours. As bad as we are, <laughs> or as good as we are. <laughs> so, would you say that your experience in the military overall was positive or negative? <clears throat> oh, it was positive. Yeah, yeah. I was really my eyes were wide open when in foreign country. Yeah, in Africa, the Free French were trying to get a new real leader, new president. I actually saw them shoot the, yeah, the candidates. And finally, uh, Charles de Gaulle prevailed. But uh, there were two candidates, and they were, one was well-liked by the people. He got shot. Yeah. And, uh, well, I wouldn't say how he got shot, really. but this is all happening the first ten, ten days we were in Africa, you know, so that opened my eyes. And then the, the uh, belligerent uh, free French, there was no need for that. We we didn't need uh, their criticism, uh, but uh, we learned, and uh, I don't think there would there'd be another invasion of Africa. Uh, we're sending uh, political experts as ambassadors, State Department. In Italy, you'll never solve their politics. They just argue and fight, <laughs> you know. But, uh, uh, but all politics in Europe, even England, you know, uh, like Churchill, he was a war hero, but they wouldn't even elect him back into office. So that uh, you can't sum up the European politics. Uh, they're all very unique. Uh, they're all they are all unique to each country that yeah. they're in. I, I actually took a course last semester yeah. up at Central. So, to conclude, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Maybe sort of a, a message from your experience to someone like someone of my generation, like yeah. myself. Well. Number one, I'm anti any any war, uh, unless you can show me a good reason. Uh, you know, I, I get disgusted with uh, us being the uh, giant controller to go in and threaten these small countries. You know, it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit, and. Uh, 
I, I have the feeling now that we should stay away from them. We have no business in their business. Uh, it's uncalled for. They haven't done anything other than them themselves. Uh, so uh, I'm still happy about our State Department, uh, but uh, there are people that are in Washington that just, well, let me see Washington, let me see the Pentagon. That's their business. War is their business. You have to watch them more than you have to watch <laughs> yeah, your own mayor. Uh, no, but I think, uh, again, uh, I don't mean these uh, irrational college Roaming and you know rodeos and whatever they have now, but then they did not have any strength. Uh, so I just, if we're gonna God bless America, we better do it at the highest level, and it's possible. It's really possible. There are people here that are, are just like you me and uh, we're helpless when they declare this and declare that uh, uh, I mean this uh, recently the uh, the threat to close down the you know that that doesn't even make sense. Yeah. What was it accomplished? I, they didn't accomplish anything. It was spite. A couple of uh, politics on one side didn't like the other side. And it's, uh, at one time it was possible. They had enough strength to really uh, have enough people in, in their corner, and uh, <coughs> our biggest problem, I think, is in foreign trade, and we should stop handling, selling uh, war weapons to any country. And that doesn't mean that Russia will stop, uh, but uh, there are other countries. Saudi Arabia is a big supplier. Iran was a big supplier. Now, that we have to curb. Uh, and I, I think, honestly, that's something that my generation is starting to see yeah. a little bit more uh, in this idea of you know, humans are human and yeah. no matter what country you're from there's still human yeah. beings and uh, America has to sort of if it puts itself on the pedestal we have to act like we belong on the pedestal as well yeah. um, and we, we can't create the conflict and then yeah. have it you know destroy us and, and blame yeah. others when we're, we're creating our own monster but uh, that, that, that actually I 100% I agree with, with everything you're saying here um, yeah I think it's I, uh, I know where you're coming from, though. <laughs> but yeah. thank you so much uh, for doing this interview, and thank you so much for your service. Shit, at any time, any time you really appreciate. It.